that the husband was a very important man in the community. He was a businessman, and, and he had 500 employees who worked for him. And because of that, and because he was the kind of guy that was type A personality, he always wanted to be involved in every aspect of his business. And he was that kind of micromanagement guy. He just wanted to be in charge of it all. That night, he was having difficulty sleeping. You know how it is. First, it's the faucet. Then it's the turning. Then it's the stealing the covers from your spouse, like he did. He stole them from his wife. And, and then your bladder starts catching on with the nervousness, right? And so you get up, and you get down, and you get up, and you lay down. And finally the wife had had enough. Finally the wife grabbed at her pillow, got out of bed, grabbed her blanket, and left. And as she was walking out the door, her husband sat up and said, What's wrong, honey? What's wrong? She turned to him and said, this bed is not big enough for 502 people. I'm going to the couch. We have to somehow understand what it feels like that way, don't we? I think all of us have understood that when life is too full. Have you ever felt that life is too full? Work 40 hours a week for 30 to 40 years, and then you retire and things get really busy, right? Some of you are nodding your head. Kids, grandkids, the back of our car has a random collection of balls, soccer, baseball, basketball, and let's not forget the bags, gymnastics, ballet, dance, scouting, and perhaps a musical instrument or two, right? This is what it is to live life. And don't, don't forget to take time for yourself. We need to rest. We need to have recreation and leisure, some gardening, watching the game, reading a book, going to the movies, Facebooking, and at the end of the day, if there's any time at all, we'll go to sleep, right? Oh, oh, I forgot, in church. Somewhere we got to fit church and all of that, too. Our lives are hectic, helter-skelter mess, and they're full. So let me introduce to you the ancient practice of fasting. Fasting. A lot of times we think in this season of Lent, Fasting is all about, well, I've got to give up something I really love and torture myself for, for, for 40 days. And maybe I can cheat whenever the sun goes down, or maybe on Sundays because they're feast days, maybe I can get away with having it then. That's not what fasting is about. Fasting is about limiting. Fasting is about limiting. In ancient times as well as today, some folks chose to give up food provide space for spiritual direction and reflection. That is, we take time where we would set a table, and instead we sit at the table of the Lord and are fed by God. It's the concept of limitation as a method of honing in on what is important, because priorities need to be met and need to be set. It's always interesting to me that people feel like their lives are so busy, and when you ask them what the most important thing is, they have difficulty. They haven't set priorities, so there's no way for them to meet them. I want to be an awesome dad. I want to be the best dad that I can be. But I'll be honest, something has to give. There are days that I have to make a decision between work and play. Yes, sometimes I get to sit in the stands, yell praises to my children on the basketball court or in the baseball field. But there are also nights that I don't get to tuck them in because I'm at a meeting that's related to work. You have to make choices. It's frustrating, but the choices have to be made and priorities have to be set. The same thing is true about our faith. Do we want to be the best Christian we can possibly be? Do we want to be the best church we can possibly be? If so, we have to set priorities. And a part of that is being spiritually disciplined in the practice of fasting. Fasting is about setting priorities and setting aside space for God moments. I could buy a cup of coffee from Starbucks, or I could give money to Stop Hunger Now. I, I could stay at home and spend time with my family watching a two-hour movie, or I could spend just ten minutes in prayer, asking God to renew the church and to provide revival again. I, I, 
could tuck my children into bed and simply tell them good night, or we could read a Bible story together as a way of passing on the faith and calming them down, perhaps for a night of rest. It's about creating space for God's moments. A lot of us miss out on God moments simply because there is no sacred space in our lives for God to come and fill. We're a donut without a donut hole. Right? I like that they brought me donut holes. That worked really well. As a people of God, we have to limit the agendas in our meetings to one or two items so that we can have time for God to guide our decisions. As a people of God, we need to limit all the stuff we feel we have to do or accumulate so that we can focus on what God wants us to do and have in our lives. In our culture, a culture of bigger, more, supersized, fasting teaches us that less is more. Less is more. Jesus says, isn't your life more than just your needs? Isn't life about something more than this? Fasting is limited. Fasting is also sacrificing, taking up our cross. You know, there's a huge difference in worship, and I can tell you that firsthand, between coming with your very, very best and coming with leftovers. There's a big difference between worship. A couple of weeks back, I was at Ettrick United Methodist Church. I went there in the afternoon. They have a brand new worship service that's directed towards the college community of Virginia State University. And it was awesome. Because basically, here's what the worship plan was. Okay, we're here to worship God. What have you brought God today? And so they brought. They brought poetry, dance, song. They brought passion. They didn't have money, I and mean, we're talking about college students. But they did have what they could bring, their very best, what they could create. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart also be. In fasting, we say no to commercialism. We say no to consumerism. And we say yes to allowing the spirit to flow through us, creating. I'm a big fan of the, the show Seventh Heaven. I liked it when it was on TV, and I always thought it was really a good illustration of the struggles of the people of faith. And one of the things that fascinated me about this show on Seventh Heaven was that at Christmas, that family wasn't allowed to go buy gifts for one another. They were not allowed to go buy gifts for each other. I mean, this is a big family, and they were not allowed to buy gifts. Instead, they had to give something they already had that they loved, or... They had to create something to do. Think about that. What if worship was like that? What if today I told you that you weren't allowed to put money in the offering plate? Beth, don't have a heart attack. <laughs> what if I told you today that you weren't allowed to put money in the offering plate, but instead you had to provide an offering of your time, your service, your prayers, and your witness? In some ways, that ups the ante on discipleship, doesn't it? It makes it a lot more difficult. I saw this at a church in Cambodia. I watched as they came together as a community. One of them had four 9-volt batteries that powered his little bitty motor scooter. He took the batteries out of his scooter and brought them to another one who had a radio. And still another one brought a coil of wire, and the youngest among them climbed up on the roof to attach the wire to the peak so that they could hear music, prayers, preaching, and news that wasn't controlled by the government. They each gave what they had or what they could create. And by doing so, they found worship. Jesus tells us that we have to have a healthy vision if we're going to be a church, if we're going to survive. If your eye is healthy, the whole body will be full of light. When we follow Christ, we take up our cross. When we follow Christ, we follow the only one who can see life and our journey clearly. When we follow Christ, we walk as a people who have a vision, who see 
what the situation is today and look ahead with the eyes of Christ and ask ourselves, where is God leading us? Where can we walk as the children of God, full of light, full of vision? If your eye is healthy, the whole body will be full of light. Fasting is about sacrificing all that we are to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Fasting is about limiting. Fasting is giving up to get real, to get the real thing. Jesus asks us today in the passage of Scripture, how many masters do you have? How many masters do you have? My wife watched a movie one time, it was The Devil Wears Prada. And, and I watched it because I thought it was going to be a theological movie. <laughs> it, it wasn't. <laughs> But in that movie, uh, there, there's this woman who tries to serve her demanding boss while at the same time having a life, satisfying her boyfriend, and getting a better job eventually. And I was fascinated by this movie. I watched it in the movie, and I got lost because there were so many people telling this young lady what she should be doing, she, what she had to do, what she couldn't do, what she should wear, how she should fix her hair, how she should do the promos. It was one boss after another, one master. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. You'll either hate the one and love the other. No one can serve two masters. By fasting, we give up earthly pursuits and desire to get real with the holy. With the holy of holies, with the spirit, with the one true God who knows our deepest essence. By fasting, we live a true life. Bonhoeffer said, it's only because Christ came and to be like us that we can become like Christ. It's only because Christ came to become like us that we can become like him. Fasting offers us an opportunity to take up our cross and to be like Jesus, to be disciples. This is the season of Lent. I know we still got Christmas matters up, but we're working on it. But it's the season of Lent. And Lent is a season when the church starts focusing on spiritual discipline, when the church starts focusing on discipleship, when the church focuses on fasting. So what is fasting? Fasting is limiting how much so that we can provide sacred space. Fasting is sacrificing to receive the true life, the life of the cross. Fasting is giving up the earthly masters to serve the heavenly Lord because we want to be like him, like Jesus, like Christ. In our culture, people often ask us, what do you want to get out of life? I think it's a nice reflective question. What do you want to get out of life? I want to challenge you to ask a different question. What will you give? What will you give out of life so that you can receive a glimpse at the true life? Because the life of faith teaches us that less is more. The life of faith teaches us that we have to give it up before we can ever give it.